Greetings from the Bible Shack. Um, hope everybody is doing well. And um, here we are back for another time of study in the Word. Um, last time we got together, I was kind of, not kind of, I was wrapping up and finishing up our study in Bible study methods. And so now it's time for a new study. Um, uh, as you've probably picked up, this time is not necessarily a, a Bible study per se, in the sense of a, a book study, but more different topics. Um, and we began with how to study our Bible and observation, interpretation, and application, and some of the bits and pieces that fit within that. Um, now, what I want to do is I want to take a number of sessions, uh, a number of weeks, and study the topic of the church. Um, and what does the Bible have to say about the church? So before we jump into that, let me pray, and uh, we'll begin session one. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, that we have not received what we deserve, and that, Lord, um, you have so kindly given us salvation through our precious Savior, the Lord Jesus. And I pray that this time of thinking carefully from your word on this topic of the church would, um, God, be beneficial to us, and that you would bless us in this. And I ask this in your Son's name. Amen. That word church uh, comes from the word ecclesia, basically, which means called out ones or the called out ones. It's interesting when you start to discuss the concept or the, the idea of the church, because so many different connotations are added to that word in our world. If you say church, many people will immediately go to the Roman Catholic Church. If you say church, they may see that that harsh particular denomination where they grew up and were treated poorly, where when I hear church, it's like saying family. It's like saying home. It's like saying mom and dad. It's, it's a sweet term to me. I love the church. Um, my background is I have no memory as far back as I can remember where I did not have a church, where I was not a part of a church, where I was not involved with other Christians to which I, I just praise God for such a blessing and the, the parents that, the home that I was raised in and the local church I was raised in. This concept of the church uh, is one that has been dealt with very uh, poorly by some in church history and has been thought through very, very carefully and well by many throughout uh, history as well. When we come to this, um, this discussion about the ecclesia, about the church, really, when you open up your Bible, you will see this idea of the church spoken of in reference to two main concepts. Now, what theologians have called the visible church and the invisible church. Uh, the church um, uh, throughout all of history and throughout the world and the church... Uh, that meets corporately in one location. And so when we say the church, we need to get a little bit of a bearings and a definition of just what we're talking about. So, for instance, when the Lord Jesus said, uh, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus was not saying, I will go start a local congregation and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. No, no, rather Jesus was speaking about the church collectively, meaning every single person who is born again throughout history, all those who are truly saved and going to heaven when they die, make up the church that Jesus is referring to in that statement. We call this the universal church, or the invisible church. This is the... Um, the true church. And so um, some of my brothers in Africa, my brothers in the Lord, they are part of the church, just as I am part of the church. We are the church. And so <clears throat> that would be the church universal. 
where when we start going through the New Testament after the book of Acts, we start to see particular groups of Christians starting to gather together, whether they're gathering in homes or, or other facilities, we start to see what we call local churches. Now, this is a uh, where, where Christians would begin to congregate together for the edification of one another, for worship, for the study of the word, so on and so forth, and for the building up of the body. Doing that in person with a particular group of people, and we call that the church. Now, this is different than the church universal. This is the church local. Um, and throughout the New Testament, we see God's plan and design for what a local church should look like, its government, um, its practices, so on and so forth. I plan to look at some of these things as the weeks to come as we continue on in this study. But for today, we have the universal church and the local church. And as you come to Jesus Christ, you become a part of that universal church. And then as you begin to gather and unify yourself with a particular gathering of believers, you unify with that local church. And the New Testament has much to say about that. Now, real quick before I move further, it's interesting to me how in our culture, so much of the time, when we make reference to the church, we speak to a building. For instance, if I say Bible study is going to be at the church, well, not really. If we really want to look at the use of this word biblically, the building is not the church. The church is meeting in that building. So it's interesting when we say, I'm going to go to church. Um, my dad would always remind me, we don't go to church, we are the church. And that's a biblical usage of that word. But oftentimes we talk about the church doors. <laughs> we talk about the locks at the church. We talk about the pulpit that's inside the church. We talk about the church's sound system. And we refer to that structure because it's easy. It's a handle to wrap up. A bunch of meanings that we're trying to get across. But when we come to the Word of God, the Word of God knows nothing of a building being the church. The Word of God knows of a group of people being the church. Universal, every saved individual throughout history, and local, God's people gathering in a certain location. Another category that, um, or I should say rather, another ingredient that comes to these this delineation between universal and local is that in the universal, you have only believers, truly born-again saved people who are in the church when they die, they're going to heaven. In the local, you may have gatherings of Christians with unbelieving uh, people in that mix, whether it's the children of believers who are unbelievers um, a children of believers who are unbelievers, or you have people who may come and visit, and you have an unbeliever coming amongst the believers. And so one distinction is that evangelism can take place with inside the walls of that building where the church is gathering. And so this is why throughout our New Testament, there's warnings, continual warnings to the local churches, because there are believers among the unbelievers in the local church. God has a great and glorious design for that local church to be a clear representation of the universal church. And so it's, it's fascinating because we have this tie that binds the fact that we are born again in Jesus Christ with other men and women who we call brothers and sisters uh, in, in our world. And, but also... I attend a local church. Pacific Coast Bible Church is an expression of the full body of Christ that gathers in one location, namely here in Pacific City, and I have the privilege of being one of the elders among the other three as we gather together as the church, God's people present. Now, as you walk through your New Testament, it takes very little effort to show this concept of the quote-unquote local church because the, the majority of the usage of this word church throughout the New Testament is speaking of the 
corporate gathering of a local assembly. When Paul wrote a letter to the church in Philippi, he's writing to believers who are gathering together in person. When he writes his letter to the church that's in Corinth, uh, the specific issues going on, it's not a specific issue that the every believer of all time is experiencing, but a particular group of Christians who are gathering together. They have particular sin issues going on in that church, and the Apostle Paul is then coming and seeking to uh, speak to those problems. And so the church of Jesus Christ, we must understand in this respect that Jesus Christ is building his church. Namely, that as people come to Christ, as people are born again, they're regenerated, the Holy Spirit indwells them. Now they're carrying the Word of God, studying the Word of God, and pouring their life into growing in godliness as disciples of Jesus. They have become a part of this church. They are the called out ones, called out from the world to the church. And unfortunately, throughout the years, I've, I've had numerous people say to me, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Now, guys, if you just think carefully about that statement, it'll be very clear in your minds that that doesn't make any sense. You are the church. And not only that, but as someone grows in godliness and comes to Christ, if you walk through your New Testament and in your own experience as a Christian, there becomes this growing need and this growing desire in the soul of a new convert to go and gather with those who are also in Jesus Christ. Um, we, as this person now has a fresh look on life, They've been born again. They're a new creation in Christ Jesus. There's a desire to be in the presence of other brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus. The, the, the New Testament doesn't have a concept of a Lone Ranger Christian. And I'm always a little bit nervous about somebody who says that they're a disciple of Christ with no grounding with other believers, because I don't see that concept in the New Testament. In the New Testament, I see believers looking for fellowship and growth and, and um, uh, the practicing of their spiritual gifts in the context of a local church, being under the authority of the elders of that local church, being there with the concern and care for the rest of that local church, and seeing how their spiritual gifts bless you and your spiritual gifts bless them. And so, yes, you're part of the universal church if you are in Christ. But the New Testament doesn't skip a beat in the sense that it goes immediately from that to being involved in a local church with the presence of other believers. And I don't know how... Those spiritual gifts, about those lists in, in 1 Corinthians and in the book of Romans that speak to the uh, specifics of you being a part of the body. Remember that whole concept is that you are a part of the body. You are in need of the rest of the body. And the rest of the body is in need of you. And so as you become a part of the universal church, it is so ingrained, natural, by design, that you then pursue to be a part of a local church with the body of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, to kick things off, as we, as we jump into this discussion about the church, I plan on touching on numerous uh, things in reference to the head of the church, the leadership of the church, the polity of the church, the ground of the church, the foundation of the church, the message of the church. I want to be touching on all of these in weeks to come. But before we go uh, and touch on all of that, I want us to have it clear in our mind the Bible's usage of this word church, the ecclesia, are the called out ones. And we see that in the universal church and we see that in the local church. In a sense, beloved, when we die, 
we leave the local church and we are embraced by and we embrace the universal church. All those who are in Jesus Christ who have come and died before us await us to be in their presence, in the presence of the Lord himself for all eternity. And so God's design for the local church, the gathering of believers on this planet for this time being, God has a specific design for the local church in this time, uh, which is absolutely fabulous. Um, and I just, this one's going to be a little bit shorter than the other videos that are coming up, but I want to close by simply sharing my personal testimony, not necessarily how I became a Christian, but just how the church has impacted me. Um, as I said earlier, I, I don't have a memory where the church is not there. As far back as I can remember, I remember getting dressed on Sunday to go and be a part of the church. I remember my pastor, who was a gentle, kind man, who had a great sense of humor, and uh, my family adored him. I had a local church where we sang praise to the Lord, and I got to hear the voices of farmers and, and uh, different people all gathering together to sing praises to the creator of the universe. I had youth leaders throughout my upbringing, men, godly men and women, who were giving themselves over, donating their time to teach and prepare, to prepare every week to come and impart their wisdom and open up the Bible to me as a little boy from uh, early, early grades of Sunday school to junior church to uh, youth group and junior high youth group and senior youth group to where I saw before my very eyes a revival in my high school youth group, which forever changed my life. And I heard the word of God preached. The gospel was declared. My mom and dad were fed with the gospel. Myself and my siblings were fed by the word of God week in, week out. We watched people die. We watched babies born. And it was a glorious thing that I took for granted and wasn't even aware of how precious it was at the time that I was experiencing it. But I grew up in a local church that I, to this day and for the rest of my life, will praise God for letting me be a part of it. I love the Church of Jesus Christ. And by that I mean I love Christians, I love believers, I love the body of Christ, the Church Universal. But man, I love the local church. I love all the, the funny little quirky aspects of local churches, um, from the, the, the discussion about hymns or praise choruses down to whether we're going to use red juice because the carpet and uh, how all that's going to work during a time of fellowship, to potlucks, to discussions to hot tears at memorial services because of dear saints who the Lord's taken home, to suicides, to the joys of brand new babies, all in the, in the context of being amongst the body of Christ and the blessed tie that binds us together, namely the Lord Jesus and the precious, sweet, sweet news of the gospel. I love the church. And at 17 years old, the Lord, in his grace, called me to serve his church as a minister. And now I, I sit here at 35 years old, and in this short little span of ministry that I've enjoyed thus far, I have an even deeper, greater passion to serve the Church of Jesus Christ. And so, for me, beloved, is, and the reason I wanted to start with this testimony is that this study, as I discuss the Church, this is not a cold, stoic, sterile environment for me. I have never been hurt deeper than in the context of the local church. And I've never experienced greater joys than in the context of the local church. <clears throat> it is a precious, precious,
precious thing to me. And I love God's people. And so, uh, as we discuss in these weeks to come the matters concerning the church, the body of Christ, um, my heart beats a little faster as we talk about communion and baptism and church membership and the head of the church and church leadership and um, all the different bits and pieces that I intend to, to speak to in the weeks to come. It flows from a man's heart that passionately, passionately loves the local church. So I look forward to unfolding more and a greater discussion, but this is more just an introduction as we come and we talk about the Ecclesia, the people of God, those that he has called and made his own, those that I call my brothers and my sisters in the Lord, those who are closer to me than my own relatives because they love the exact same Jesus that I love. Uh, and so my hope and prayer is that uh, the, these studies, as they come out, would be a special blessing to you and that God will uh, freshly remind you of the very special people he's called you to be a part of. Uh, you are, if you are his, you are part of this ecclesia. And God has a marvelous purpose for you in the context of his local church. And so let me ask God's blessing on the, the studies to come and on you, my, my church family. Father, I pray and ask that in the weeks to come as we consider and study um, what your word has to teach us about who we are as the bride of Jesus, that, Lord, you would freshly remind us how sweet it is to be a child of God. And, Lord, what a gift it is that we get to be amongst the people of God. Father, I pray that you would give me clarity of thought and wisdom in how I uh, bring these messages in the weeks to come. And I pray that PCBC, their hearts would be touched by the truth of your word and that they would cling a little tighter to the great blessing of their local, local church. And um, Father, I pray for your blessing on PCBC uh, during uh, the COVID-19 um, restrictions and the scare that has rushed through our world. Father, I pray for your blessing as our county uh, seeks to reopen, as our church, we look at how best to reopen. And that, Father, above all, in the hearts of your people, you would be glorified. For, Lord, we were made, we were called, born again, for the sake of your name. And so, Father, may we be a bright, shiny representation of the universal church as we gather as a local church for the praise and honor and glory of Jesus Christ, the head of the church. And it's in his name that I pray and ask this. Amen. Love you guys and uh, look forward to bringing more of these sessions to you in the weeks to come.